Okay, so I think we're ready to get started. Are we ready to get started? Yes. Wow, everyone's excited. I probably should get excited too. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually kind of amazed how full it is here. So one of the things they, they asked us to remind everyone is, is that uh, if you're on the edges and you, um, you get kind of full, so feel free to, to crowd in next to each other in an uncomfortable way. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it looks like we're okay. So, um, so um, this talk is called uh, What's Old is New Again, an Introduction to WebAssembly. I know in the, in, in the little program it just said an introduction to WebAssembly, but I, I like two-part titles. Uh, and um, I called it this because WebAssembly feels kind of like a rehashing of old ideas into a new form, which, um, well, actually, as it turns out, is pre pretty much most of our industry. Uh, I, that's what we've been doing for the last 40 years. And so, uh, yeah, so I, th I thought it was a, a kind of a neat way to think about it. And so I got this picture of this old adding machine here, uh, which is sort of a precursor to uh, more complicated adding machines that we call microprocessors. So my name is Guy Royce. I'm a, a developer evangelist at DataRobot. Um, developer evangelist means that my job is to come out at all these sorts of events and give talks on whatever I, strikes my fancy, honestly. Um, as long as I mention that, hey, I work for DataRobot and we think we're awesome and you should check us out. So go do that. And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Guy Royce, um, and I've got um, all my code, uh, including some of the code you'll see today, on at code.guy.dev. That redirects to, uh, to my GitHub, and you can go read my out-of-date blog at guy.dev. I, uh, you know, Google released the new .dev domains recently, and I got guy.dev, which um, is probably the most awesome domain name ever. <laughs> <laughs> It only cost me $180 American per year. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, check my stuff out online. Uh, follow me, tweet at me, whatever. Uh, but this is who I am. So uh, what is WebAssembly? So uh, I asked my uh, computer wife, Karen, uh, what WebAssembly was. And she said it was 50% web and 50% assembly, uh, which is kind of true, actually. Um, it is assembly for the web. Uh, but what it is, and what all technology always is, is it's really a solution to a problem. And that problem is JavaScript. <laughs> what the hell, JavaScript? Um, I, I went out and grabbed some random bits of JavaScript that makes no sense here, just to share and uh, poke fun at JavaScript. And I want to qualify this by saying that I actually enjoy JavaScript as a programming language. And that's because after I work all day, I go home and I drink. <laughs> Um, but I actually do enjoy it unironically. Um, I, I, I like these dynamic languages. And I know a lot of people are fans of TypeScript, uh, but I still kind of like JavaScript. Uh, but it's got some weird corners. Um, you know, for example, array is equal to not array. That, sure, OK. <laughs> that, that seems real. Uh, not a number is not equal to not a number. Um, that was actually a design decision, so I really can't fault uh, that too much. I do like number.min value being greater than zero. That has not been my experience with my bank. <laughs> uh, my favorite is that if you call parseint and pass it the word fire truck, that returns not a number. Totally cool with that. That makes perfect sense. Fire trucks are definitely not numbers. However, if you say fire truck comma 16, it returns 15. And the reason it does that is because it's, gonna, it's looking for a hex digit. F is 15 in hex. And the rest of it is not numbers. So it just says, well, I'm done. Um, if you're wondering why I picked the word fire truck, well, um, I was looking for a word that started with F and ended with other letters. <laughs> uh, that expressed my opinions about this particular method. <laughs> um, I like console.log, and then you can just call dot .call repeatedly. Um, and that's because call is a function, and every function in JavaScript has the call function on it, including call. And so you can call it as many times as you like before you actually apply a function, which is also a function that's on every function, including itself. And so you can do really goofy things like that. And the math.min is greater than math.max, uh, true. Um, not sure how that's true. Uh, I mean, even if you're doing like, you know, uh, floating point or, uh, an integer, and you've gone around the horn, you, you've, uh, you've overflowed. I don't think that's true. So um, yeah, JavaScript's got some weird corners. Now, in defense of JavaScript, 
You know, it was written in a week. And so I'm, I'm willing to cut us some slack. Um, but, you know, sometimes uh, if you're doing front-end development, a lot of the problems is, is that, well, you can choose any language you want to do front-end development as long as it's JavaScript. Right? That's the only game in town. If you want to do web client-side development, you're doing JavaScript. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, well, no, I can you know, use a transpiler and use uh, some other language like uh, Elm or um, TypeScript. And that's true. You just have to set up a simple, modern JavaScript environment with a bunch of tools. Some of these aren't actually all that modern anymore in JavaScript terms because they're you know, a few weeks old. <laughs> but um, you've got all these, these tools. And these are just some ones I picked at random. Um, but I've sort of got this thought in my head. It's like, if I have to have an NPM tool that I install that helps me create projects for my project, maybe we're doing it wrong. Right? That's, that's actually kind of a convoluted. If, I, if setting up a project and all of my dependencies is that hard, maybe it's too hard. Um, but some of these are quite frustrating. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the image in the background, I had a tendency to uh, a lot of these tools are knives. And I, I think that's my subconscious trying to tell me something. <laughs> uh, but there's actually uh, an even more fundamental problem to a lot of this, to, to JavaScript in the, in the browser. And that's that uh, it's interpreted. And so for every single um, JavaScript file, you've got to download that file. And you can make that faster by minifying it. That helps. But it's still, it's, you still have to download it. And then you have to take that file and you have to tokenize it and find those individual syntactic tokens that you care about. N not you personally, but the, the browser has to do that. Uh, <laughs> God, I wouldn't want to have to do that personally. That'd be, no, 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 let's run this JavaScript. OK, let's pull it apart by hand. You know. <laughs> Uh, and after you've tokenized that, you've got a big list of tokens. Then you've got to parse that and build a syntax tree. And then you execute that tree. And this is a slow process, uh, relatively speaking. Um, and it's uh, one of the reasons why interpreted languages are kind of slow. Um, but what if there's a way to avoid uh, all of the, these steps? What if you could compile code for the browser? What if you could compile that JavaScript? Or, or anything, right? Well, that would solve a lot of problems, right? You uh, would, well, tokenizing and building trees is what compilers do. And so if you could compile that code, then you could skip those two steps. Um, if you could compile code that would run on the browser, you wouldn't be stuck with JavaScript. You could pick a different language. Uh, you could do it in Rust, for example, or uh, C++, because who doesn't want to build a web app in C++? <laughs> Guess what, everybody? Pointers are back. <laughs> um, and um, the tooling could be a lot simpler. That is what WebAssembly is trying to do. Uh, WebAssembly is an assembly language for the web. Uh, it's, and that's actually a slight misnomer, and we'll get into that in greater detail. Uh, what it really is is it's a virtual machine for the web it, running in the browser. So uh, quick show of hands from the audience. Um, so uh, if I ask for a show of hands, how many of you won't raise your hand? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, how many of you have uh, programmed in assembly language before? OK. How many of you have been paid to do it? A, a handful, OK. How many just did it in university and then have not touched it since? <laughs> yeah. um, I did assembly language in the 80s when I was in, in uh, high school. And uh, I'm in my late 40s, and I'm on the old side for having done it. And so I thought it might be worthwhile to do a little refresher on uh, wh what machine code is and how assembly works. And I'll, I'll go kind of quick, because I, I really want to spend more time in the demo than I do want to talking about the past. But there's, it kind of builds up. It's, it's relevant. So as we know, computers only understand ones and zeros, right? That's the, the th thing they always teach you when you're a little kid about computers. You're first learning about them. Um, but that is literally true. Actually, it's not literally true. It really only understands voltages, right? And then we say those voltages are ones and zeros. But um, what we end up programming in to a microprocessor is a series of instructions that are a, patterns, a pattern of ones and zeros. And we can represent that lots of ways. So here is a, uh, a simple little assembly program that just does a doubly nested loop. On the left here, I've got an, an address, just a random address in hex and memory. Uh, we've got a binary representation of those instructions to the microprocessor. Now you can see 
trying to code in binary, that would be very painful. That's hard to read. I, I just, all I see is just a pattern. I don't really see uh, any meaning in there. And so we could do it in hex instead. And uh, that would be a little easier because uh, it's a little easier to read those. But um, the, uh, the true uh, um, moment of, um, I don't know, I'm trying to come up with a good metaphor, I'm failing. But the, the true um, more powerful version of doing that is to create symbols. And so over here we have assembly language. Come on, cursor, go to the right. There we go. And so uh, each of these symbols, interestingly, corresponds to exactly one byte that the, instruct the microprocessor receives. And so there's a one-to-one -one relationship between that assembly language and the byte that gets sent to the microprocessor. This is a 6502 uh, assembly language because uh, that was what I programmed on in the 80s when I was a kid. And uh, it's kind of interesting to look at this because you can see uh, different things about that microprocessor here. So uh, for example, you can see the, in the addresses, uh, here we got loop two, which is address 0204. And if we see the jump to loop two, you can see right over here, there's the 0204. And you can see the, uh, the big Indian notation there, which is kind of neat. Uh, that's not something that I've you know, really ever have to think about on a daily basis. You all learn about you know, little Indian and big Indian notation, but it doesn't really come up very often uh, when programming in Ruby. <laughs> so, but, uh, so this was uh, assembly. And so we started out you know, doing hex and binary and stuff like that on really, really early primitive computers. Assembly was a great move forward because it allowed us to program in symbols that we recognized, things that we could actually think, think about. LDY saying load the value into the Y register is way easier to understand because you got the LDY to remind you what it means as opposed to A0 which uh, it could mean anything, right? And so assembly was a great move forward in programming. And everyone loved it, except for von Neumann, as it turned out. He has a great quote here. He was uh, using grad students to uh, hand assemble programs and uh, then put them in. And of course, uh, grad students, being the uh, lazy human beings that all good programmers are, uh, decided to write an assembler. And he got angry when he found out they'd written an assembler. He said uh, uh, that it was a waste of a valuable scientific computing instrument to use it to do clerical work. Now, I find this extraordinarily funny. So um, how many of you would say that your day job of programming is using computers to do clerical work? <laughs> That's like everything we do, right? I worked for an insurance company uh, in the US for about 12 years. Insurance is clerical work. Um, I mean, I've got this magic device that we all have in our pockets. Mine's here telling me how much time I have left. And uh, I don't even use it for clerical work. I look at it to watch, uh, you know, well, I guess cat videos on the internet. Is, is that still a funny cliche? I'm, I've lost track. But, um, but I use it to watch worthless entertainment. I don't even use it for clerical work. I use it for entertainment. And so uh, I think this is a great example of... Uh, just sometimes even the greatest geniuses can sometimes have a blind spot as to the potential of a thing. Um, and it's just kind of funny in, in hindsight, yeah, which is always 2020, of course. Um, but he would be proud of me because that code we were looking at earlier is actually the first assembly program that I ever wrote. And um, I actually wrote out the assembly on the left here on paper. And I still have this, I, I, I kept it after 30 years. And then I put the memory address, and then I hand assembled it into uh, hex. And then I had a circuit board, and I could key in the hex code into the keypad there. So uh, von Neumann would be proud. Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, eventually, of course, uh, we, uh, assembly gave way to higher order languages like C and C++, and, and, and eventually th uh, things that we use today more often. And uh, we could take that C code. And, combine, and compile it uh, right into uh, that machine code. And so we didn't need to even think about what the instruction set on that microprocessor looked like anymore. And that was a great advancement forward. And you could run it on your microprocessor, and everything was good. But there was uh, a, a small problem with that. And that is that there are a lot of microprocessors in the world. And so uh, if you had some, say, a video game you wrote, Aside from differences of hardware architecture, the physical microprocessor might be like a Motorola versus an Intel microprocessor and have different instruction sets. Um, and so the assembly code, the, the, the machine code you needed to generate was different. 
And so you had to compile it twice. And then as backwards compatible microprocessors came out, people would compile it to the lowest common denominator. So you've got a 286 machine, um, but the code you're running is, is for an 8086 microprocessor. And so it still runs on your 286, but it can't take advantage of the advanced features that make it more powerful. And um, so th that was a bit of a problem. And so we solved it using the solve that we always use in computer programming, which is we created another layer of abstraction. Uh, and in this case, the layer of abstraction was the virtual machine. Uh, I first ran into this idea uh, in Java in the, uh, in the 90s with the Java virtual machine, um, but it's not a, it's not a new idea. Uh, but the idea there was is that if we could create a, a virtual microprocessor that we compiled everything to instead, then that would be a lot, a lot easier. Then I could write it once and debug it everywhere, as opposed to writing it once and running it everywhere. And, um, or, and so um, that worked pretty well. And so this uh, C code here now is Java code and we uh, compile that to Java bytecode. And then that runs on the virtual processor, which then runs it as interpreted against the physical microprocessor. And that was great. And um, it actually led to some advantages where you could start doing things like, well, I can compile this code just in time. So I can take that bytecode and compile it into machine code as needed. And I could compile it to the exact specific microprocessor you had. It didn't have to be lowest common denominator. And that is what we're doing with WebAssembly. WebAssembly is that same layer of abstraction on top of a, a same virtual microprocessor, but it's running in your browser. And it doesn't do the just-in-time compilation yet, but it will, uh, because it's such an obvious thing to do. And there are, you know, the browsers can implement that quite easily. Well, not easily, but they could cert it's, very, it's a very doable thing. Uh, WebAssembly is just that same concept of virtual machine, but in a browser. And uh, it's worth noting, um, people often ask uh, what browsers support this. Uh, well, I've got four icons there, which you probably recognize, right? We've got Chrome, Safari, uh, Internet Explorer, or sorry, Edge. <laughs> years and years of habit. I actually totally did that by mistake. That wasn't a joke. Uh, <laughs> And because um, we all know Safari is the new IE. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there's Safari, speaking of Safari, and Safari. And all four of these major browser vendors support WebAssembly um, very, very thoroughly. And even their mobile equivalents also support them. So you can run WebAssembly code in Safari on your iPhone or in, uh, in Chrome on your, your Android phone. And so uh, that's kind of interesting because that means I could run this stuff on my phone. So uh, here's how WebAssembly sort of lives in the browser, to think of it conceptually. Uh, the main thing to understand is that a WebAssembly uh, module is a, it's a, it's a WASM file. We use a .wasm extension. And it's just another file that's downloaded from your web server, just like your CSS, just like your HTML, just like your JavaScript. And so it's just another resource that web servers serve up. Uh, it's got content type application slash, is it WASM or WebAssembly? I can't remember. Um, but so you, you might have to tweak your uh, web server to have an extra content type. But other than that, it's just a straight up, it's very typical, um, it's just another file to download. And in the browser itself, you can see here on the left, we've got our trifecta of front end web development, our CSS, our HTML, and our JavaScript, and three separate files. And then we have this WebAssembly module here. And then we're showing the, the, the virtual machine there sort of symbolically. And I've got these arrows showing. Uh, how, how they can interact. And so you can see I've got an arrow pointing both directions from the WebAssembly to the JavaScript and the JavaScript to the WebAssembly. And that's because JavaScript is used to instantiate that WebAssembly and then you can call functions that you have expo exported in that WebAssembly module. But WebAssembly can also call JavaScript functions that have been imported into it. So they can call each other. So you can do callbacks and stuff like that. Um, and we also, of course, you, know, you can use JavaScript to manipulate the DOM but there's a really significant arrow missing. And that's the arrow right here. WebAssembly can't talk to the DOM directly. Not yet. Um, where all WebAssembly can do is interact with JavaScript and JavaScript can interact with that. And so you can do DOM manipulation, but you have to create these bridge functions between WebAssembly uh, written in JavaScript to do those sorts of things. So if you wanna you know, insert an element, then you'd have to call a JavaScript function that would insert that element for you. Uh, 
So um, that's, that's sort of a missing piece. It makes things a little more, more complicated, or, or as I like to say, interesting. <laughs> and um, this is sort of, sort of the ecosystem they live in. Um, I'm going to get into actually building some st simple stuff with uh, WebAssembly. And I'm going to be using uh, two main languages to do this. Of course, I'm going to be using JavaScript, because uh, we're, we, we have to use JavaScript to actually create that WebAssembly, instantiate that WebAssembly module, and to get it to start doing anything. And uh, for the WebAssembly code, I'm going to use a um, um, WebAssembly text format. So WebAssembly is actually slightly misnamed. It's really web byte code, right? That's, that's the key innovation is, is uh, we haven't created a, an assembly language for the browser. We've created a byte code for the browser. And so um, WebAssembly text format is the assembly language for that byte code. Um, I will say that I do not recommend anyone use WebAssembly text format for production code, because uh, who wants to build their web apps in assembly language? I mean, other than me. <laughs> uh, but it is interesting to see how it all works. Um, those are the two main languages I'm going to be using today to uh, show how WebAssembly works. I am going to do a little bit of Rust at the end. Uh, I'm not going to code it. I'm just going to show that it, it does indeed work. Uh, I'm not actually a very strong Rust developer, so I ho cobbled together a simple implementation of FizzBuzz and then, uh, and then I swap it out, Martha Stewart style. So, uh, so let's get started. So here is a simple WebAssembly module in WebAssembly text format. Uh, you can see here we've got this little uh, keyword at the top module that says, hey, this is a module. Uh, here we're exporting a function. We're going to export it as add, and internally it's referenced as dollar $add. And then here's our implementation of that function. Right? You can see here we, uh, that add function takes a parameter named dollar $A, and it's a 32-bit integer. It takes another parameter, dollar $B, it's a 32-bit integer. And it has a result, a return value of a 32-bit integer. So this is a very complicated function. <laughs> can we add A plus B? Yes, yes we can. And then um, we, in, in the implementation here, we get those two local values off of those parameters, and then we call add, and then we get a result. And it's worth noting uh, that WebAssembly is a stack-based uh, virtual machine. And so what that means is that um, there's no uh, local variables. There actually is capability for local variables, but um, you don't need to use them as a matter of course. And so uh, here we are. Uh, our uh, add function's been called, our stack is empty. So we call uh, get local dollar $A, and that gets that dollar $A parameter and pushes that onto the stack. And we call get local dollar $B, and unsurprisingly, it does exactly the same thing. And so now we've got a stack with the values of 5 and 10 on it. When we call add, it pops both of those values off the stack, adds them together, and pushes that value back onto the stack. So we're, we're just using the stack to keep track of our state. Now, for adding two numbers together, this is pretty straightforward, but you could see how this could get messy quick, right? If you're trying to do anything, any kind of math problem that has parentheses in it, it gets hard. But uh, at the end of the function, um, we have a single value on the stack. That's the return value. And so that's, that's, that's that stack-based thing working. There we go. There's our return value. To do this from the JavaScript side, you have to instantiate it. And so here we've got uh, two ways that you can instantiate. The first one, uh, they both use promises, and so you could also use async await. Uh, but we call fetch to go pull down that WASM file. And then um, we get a response. We get the bytes out of that response. And we use those bytes to instantiate it. And then uh, once we instantiate it, we get a module that we can use. Uh, and that's OK. It's a little less uh, performant than just calling instantiate streaming, which will start uh, uh, assembling, or uh, it, it'll start interpreting, the, interpreting that WebAssembly module right off the bat. So here's the difference here. Um, calling WebAssembly.instantiate with bytes is OK. Calling it with instantiate streaming is better. And uh, my examples actually use the first format, because when I first put this talk together, I don't know, it's been about nine months now, uh, Safari was having a little bit of trouble with the, the second syntax. And so I was easy on it. But uh, here, so we just, you say WebAssembly to instantiate and you hand it bytes. That's really all there is to it. Um, once you've got that module, it's just a bag of functions. So module.instance.exports, exports is where all the exported functions are at. 
and uh, we have an add there. We pass in our five and 10, and we get 15 back as our x. And so this works in either of these scenarios. And I mentioned that we can also call back uh, from WebAssembly modules into JavaScript. And so here we've got the, you know, that, that calls to add. On the left here, we've got our JavaScript code. On the right here, we have sort of a block representation of our WebAssembly module. And we see it's got a dollar add, a dollar subtract, and a dollar log. And dollar log is an imported function uh, that allows us to call this console.log uh, that I've implemented here. I did it as an arrow function simply because it, it looked better on one line of code. That's the only reason. It doesn't have to be an arrow function. Um, to do an import, this is what you have to do on the WebAssembly text format side. So down here in the bottom, we'll say import, and we got these two magic strings, JS and log. And then we say, hey, uh, take this function you're importing and assign it to dollar $log. And I'm fully expecting it to only take a 32-bit integer as a parameter. You might notice that I'm logging numbers. There's a reason for that that I'll get to. And uh, so that's what you have to do on the WebAssembly side. On the JavaScript side, what you have to do is you create this imports object that you see here in the middle. And this imports object has just a uh, doubly nested dictionary, uh, JavaScript object. And uh, that, that JS and that log correspond to those two magic strings that were in the, uh, yeah, down here in the import. And uh, once you have that imports object, you pass it into your call to instantiate streaming as the second argument. And now all the things that are in there are potentially available to that WebAssembly module. And so this is how you can hand functions into WebAssembly for it to call back on. There's actually another way to get code running inside of WebAssembly, and uh, that's with a start um, instruction here. So I'm saying start dollar $main. And what start dollar $main does in WebAssembly text format is it uh, says, when you are instantiated, start running the main function. You can think of that as a void main or maybe a constructor, depending on how you want to think about it. Uh, but it's a way of kicking off that code. And so you could create a module that has no exports and only has imports, and main is what starts it off running, and then it just calls back and intera interacts with the, the JavaScript in the through the browser, interacts with the browser through JavaScript that it imported. Uh, and in fact, that probably is, if you really wanted to build that web app in C++ or Rust, uh, that'd probably be the way to, to tackle it. Yeah, there we go. Another slide sh just showing that better. <laughs> uh, I mentioned that uh, I had a log function that took numbers. So this is uh, one of the things that everyone kind of groans at with WebAssembly is when I say, uh, it doesn't know what strings are. They're like, how do I program without strings? Everything's a string. In fact, uh, WebAssembly doesn't even know what arrays are. It just doesn't have a concept for arrays. And if you think about it, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? A microprocessor doesn't know what arrays are. A microprocessor doesn't know what strings are. Those are structures that were brought in later as part of higher order programming languages. WebAssembly is trying to be that low level technology to enable higher level programming languages other than JavaScript in the browser. And so uh, it makes sense that it would only operate with numbers. Uh, but there is a way to get around that uh, because at some point you do need to actually do strings. And that has to do with uh, shared memory. And so in WebAssembly, you've got this concept of a shared memory module. Uh, and here uh, we're importing it right there. Um, and it's imported in the imports object exactly the same way that imported functions are. And then once you have that shared memory, you can start manipulating it. So uh, the data statement is a, a constant, just when this module loads, shove this right here. And so I'm saying, in position zero, shove the value 13. So I32 const zero. 13. So that puts a hard-coded value in there. But uh, when in code, in your main function, for example, you can also manipulate that. And so here uh, I'm saying, I'm pushing onto the stack uh, i32 const of 1, says at, at position 1, value of 23 is the next value on the stack, and then store it. And so you can manipulate this as well. This is a lot of code for not a lot of work, isn't it? <laughs> On the JavaScript side, 
you have to create that memory object. Uh, so I've got a WebAssembly.memory. And then uh, there it is being imported. Right, so when we create it, nulls it all out. There's our import, and we pass that imports into um, our instantiate streaming. And then this is running that code we were just looking at, so 12, 13 and 23 automatically get populated. And then we can, in JavaScript, take that memory buffer and put it through a UN8 array, and then just treat it like an array and go access those values. So that's a way of sharing data back and forth between JavaScript and WebAssembly. And you can manipulate that buffer as well and just say shared you know, sub 3 equals 42. It shoves 42 at position 3. And so you can manipulate this quite easily, uh, more, much more easily on the JavaScript side than you can on the WebAssembly side. And so you can use this to do strings. So I said WebAssembly doesn't do strings. That's not completely true. Uh, there actually is this idea of a string constant in the WebAssembly text format. So right here, I've, I've said, at position zero, put this string. And that last bit of number there, that slash zero, zero, that is uh, saying slash zero means a number follows. And then I put the number zero, um, which means I've made a null terminated string. <laughs> What's old is new again. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's neat because it's actually supporting UTF-8. So this is, uh, you know, I, I used emojis here. This is hello world and emoji, right? <laughs> got the waving hand, you got the little globe icon. Uh, I live in the US, so I use the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Western hemisphere facing. <laughs> I had to pick one. I was like, I, I want the one that has my house in it. So, <laughs> but, uh, so you can store that string right in there. And then what you can do is if you want to return a string, is you can return the address where the string starts. Can, can anyone say pointers? <laughs> All right, what's old is new again, right? <laughs> um, and so now you've got a pointer to that string, and you know at the end of the string there's a zero. So you can then say start here, find the zero, take everything in between, convert it to text. And you can do that from JavaScript here. And so this is some quick code. I'm not going to go deep into it, but um, uh, the key thing here is we're using the text decoder and setting it up for UTF-8. And then we can go into that, uh, that memory and pull out, um, particularly like right here, uh, you can, when you say, you create that new array, you can say starting at position whatever. And so I, in this case, it would be starting at position zero, grab me this whole array. And then we can look for that zero and then slice that array down to the size we want. And then we can decode that using the text decoder. And now we can return a string from WebAssembly to JavaScript. Um, now, that string is hard-coded. <laughs> um, in there, if you wanted to generate strings or hand strings in, it gets messier because it doesn't really, you'd have to write all kinds of string manipulation routines. So I actually implemented a full version of FizzBuzz that had a model view controller pattern and used strings and everything, and I had to figure out how to convert numbers into strings, and so I had to write uh, i to a from c, and I, <laughs> I had to write a function to do, to do powers in WebAssembly. It took me three days to build FizzBuzz uh, with strings in uh, WebAssembly text format. I learned a lot. It was a fun exercise. You can go look at the uh, wonderful code, Rivals Enterprise FizzBuzz, let me tell you. Um, but um, yeah, so this is how you can do strings if you need to. So that is useful. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that's in the, uh, in the uh, WebAssembly text format. You've got these idea of local variables, where you can just define a local. Uh, you've got uh, global variables, which are sort of like shared memory, but they're just one discrete value that JavaScript can see. Um, this sort of stack-based stuff can get messy, and so you can use uh, parentheses uh, for S expressions, and it starts looking kind of lispy, which is um, kind of fun if you like lisp, if, if, you, if you like pairing up parentheses all the time. Um, and uh, there's also this idea of tables. And tables are sort of like a, a shared memory uh, for functions. So it's a, it's a table of function pointers. And so you can uh, shove functions in there, and JavaScript can shove functions in there. And so it's a way of allowing you to do things like uh, V tables or function pointers uh, in that lower language. 
Uh, and speaking of other languages, right now, if you want to play with something with WebAssembly other than what we're doing here today, um, by and large, Rust is your best bet. Uh, Rust, I, I think, has the best support for WebAssembly. Uh, I didn't have to install anything particularly special to make it work. I mean, I had some stuff I had to figure out, but it wasn't, um, it was all Rust stuff. I was using Cargo to bring it all in. It wasn't anything particularly unusual. Uh, C++ has decent, got decent support as well. Uh, there's a wonderful tool called Inscriptum, which uh, will take LLVM bit code and transpile it, and I guess transpile, compile, transsemble, I don't, I don't know what the word would be here, uh, but to uh, WebAssembly bytecode. And so that's a piece of Inscriptum. Uh, Inscriptum will actually go further. It'll create WebAssembly. It'll create all of your Glue JavaScript. It'll create your HTML. It'll create your CSS. And so you can create a simple command line application, and it'll, it'll make a terminal in, in a browser. Um, so it, it, it's a full compile my C program to something that I can do on the web. And so uh, there's good support there. It's a little more challenging to navigate, but um, it, it is well supported. And Microsoft's really kind of doubled down on um, WebAssembly. They've built a Blazor. Some of you probably heard of Blazor. I think there was, uh, yeah. Uh, Blazor is actually sitting on top of all this. And so what they've done is they've taken Mono uh, and compiled it to WebAssembly. And so they took, so you've got the common language runtime, which is a virtual machine running in the WebAssembly virtual machine. So you've got a virtual machine in a virtual machine in the browser. Yo, dog. <laughs> um, but it, it's actually very powerful, and they've created a lot of the glue code to interact with the DOM so that you can just treat it as a compilation target. And so um, Blazor is actually pretty cool. And so if you want to want to support, uh, you want to do something like that, that's the one thing that I think would be, uh, I'd be willing to do production code with Blazor. I think these other things are still kind of green, and they need a little bit more maturity before I'd I'd want to go all in. But if you want to build tech stacks that make use of this, this stuff is really useful. So let's do a demo. Let's watch me actually code in this assembly language. Is everyone ready to watch me fail? <laughs> Yay. If I succeed, I get applause. If I fail, I get laughter. Either way, it's a win. <laughs> OK, so I've got um, I have some background here. Yeah, I do. OK, so I've got a, um, who all is familiar with Jasmine as a testing framework for JavaScript? Enough of you. Uh, so it's just a unit testing framework. That's what I'm going to use. Uh, I've got a little spec file here. I've got a wasm.helper. And this is just a little function I wrote that loads the WebAssembly module, and it returns the export section. So here's that response, and then I get the bytes, then I get the module. So this is the, the slow bad way. But with, instead of with promises, I'm using async await. And I return that exports. And so in fizzbuzz here, then I'll, I'll describe fizzbuzz. And since strings are hard, I'm not going to return fizz and buzz and fizzbuzz. I'm going to return negative 1 for fizz, negative 2 for buzz, and negative 3 for fizzbuzz. So we can't do fizzbuzz on negative numbers, sorry. Um, and then I've got this little spec helper here, which just makes sure the tests aren't run in a random order which uh, normally I would want, but because it's a demo, that's confusing. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start up my web server here using my wonderful Python trick that I learned at another conference years ago. That'll just create a web server in my uh, NDC Oslo 2019 folder. And then if I go to uh, localhost 8000 spec runner, hit command shift R, you can say, hey, there's no specs because I haven't written any. So let's write a test. Is, is this text big enough? Is that readable, by the way, in the back? OK. I tried I try to make it as big as I could and still fit it on the screen. So, OK, so describe. And I've also got one of those N minus 1 Mac keyboards that are really awkward to type on. So please forgive me if I fumble through this. So uh, we're going to describe fizzbuzz. I'm going to use arrow functions here. And we're going to say, we need it before each. And that has to have it done because it's asynchronous. It also needs to be um, async. And so I can call uh, this dot subject equals uh, load wasm. And we're going to bring in slash fizz buzz 
wasm. So this is going to be loading that WebAssembly module. And that is asynchronous, so it needs, we, need to know what, we need to wait for it. Then once we have that, we can just call done. And that will uh, load up my module new each time between each test. And say it returns minus, uh, returns the number it is given. And we can say expect this dot subject dot fizzbuzz one to v one. So we give it a one, we get a one, right? This first test you always write for fizzbuzz. Let's run those tests and see if I did it correctly. Did I do something wrong here? Did I not save it? Am I in the wrong folder? Wow, I'm failing. Sub this is the part where you laugh. <laughs> um, I'm sure. Surely, I'm doing something boneheaded here. Oh, it timed out. That's actually what we'd expect, because we're going out and we're trying to load a file from the server, and it's not there. So we got a five. Uh, we got a timeout. So that is what it should be doing. So let's uh, let's build a WASM file or a WAT file, we'll call it fizzbuzz.wat. And uh, we're going to use a couple different tools to compile this once we get it working, but let's, let's code it up first. Module, so I need a module, and I want to export a function called fizzbuzz. There we go. And fizzbuzz is a func named $fizzbuzz. And so that's all we do, we're just mapping a function named fizzbuzz to an external string. Then we can define a func called fizzbuzz and say it takes a param of uh, called dollar num and it's an i32. And uh, we want it to uh, return, we want it to do the, the simplest thing it can do. So we'll say i32 const one. Okay, so always return one. That'll make our test pass. So uh, we've got a couple options for compiling this. One option is, is I have a, uh, a tool uh, as part of a Visual Studio code, an extension, um, uh, which is the WebAssembly binary, no, it's not the WebAssembly binary toolkit. It, it's in my slide, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but I can do here, save as WebAssembly binary file. It'll ask me for the file name, I'll save it, and now I've got a WASM file. And if I look, I can see my WASM file is, it's binary, so it doesn't want to look at it. But if I say I want to open it anyhow, it will disassemble it. And so we can see there's my fizzbuzz implementation that returns a one. And it's added this type structure saying, hey, well, you know, we've got a type which is a function that takes a 32-bit integer. And so this function is of that type. So it adds that as well. And you see our ex export. But otherwise, it's pretty much the code I wrote. So that's kind of neat. Um, and so we should be able to if we can get to the right window here, rerun this and watch it not want to work. Hmm. Do I have a, a typo? Oh, yeah, I do. That's what I did wrong. Thank you. Pair programming for the win. <laughs> I need a result that is of I32. That is what it's doing wrong. So this would be a great time to show you the other way to compile this code. So I've got a tool here. Uh, if we look, I've got this. Uh, I wanted to background that. Let's background that. There we go. If, I, if you look at it, I've got this uh, WAT build. And all this does is it, it removes the, the existing fizzbuzz. And then it uses a tool called Webit, Wabbit. Yes, it's called Wabbit, <laughs> the WebAssembly Binary Toolkit. And Wabbit has a tool called Wat to Wasm. <laughs> and it takes a Wat and converts it into a Wasm. <laughs> uh, these names are great. <laughs> uh, I just love that it's called Wabbit. They actually point out that that's how it's pronounced in the, in, in the, uh, on the web page about it, because they really want you to know that they're making an Elmer Fudd joke. <laughs> but I can call. Um, 
wat build.sh, and that will remove the old one and create a new one. And so that's another way of doing that. There we go. Returns the number it was given. Hooray! <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> um, let's make this do some more things, right? We don't want it to just be hard coded. So we need another test. It returns other numbers it is given, right? So let's give it a two and run our tests. And we see that that fails because one is not two. Imagine that. Unless you're using JavaScript and then it, it's probably greater than, yeah. So we'll go in here and, so the problem here of course is that we're returning a hard coded one. So let's get that local value, that dollar $num instead. So we can call get local dollar $num and get rid of the const. And if we do wet build again, now it's passing. So, yay. <laughs> um, but that's not a very good fizz buzz, right? Right now it's just, it's an echo function. We want something more than that. So um, I'm gonna say it returns minus one for multiples of three. So if I pass it a three, I should get back a minus one. And I typed that wrong in the test. There we go. If I run that, you can see that it says got three, uh, expected minus one. So we can fix that. And by saying, we need to check to see if it's equal to three or not. So I32 const three. And then we can say EQ, is it equal? And that's going to return zero or not zero for whether it's equal. And we can run that through the if statement, which says, run this code if the stack is zero or not zero. Pop the stack, look at it, and evaluate it. And we can say i32 const negative one, return. And then if we get down here where the cursor's at, our stack will be empty. So we have to uh, then return the number. So we still need to turn around and get local again. Let's do that. Build it, run it, we're doing better. So uh, let's do um, other multiples of three. And we'll hand it a six, and this will get rid of our hard-coded, this will force us to do a modulus. So that fails. And so we'll go back to the WAT file. Has anyone ever seen that JavaScript talk called WAT? Yeah, that's what I think of every single time I, I, I work with WebAssembly text format, WAT. <laughs> so, uh, and here I need to do basically the same thing. And so um, I don't always reuse code, but when I do, I copy and paste. <laughs> put in a five there, put in a minus two there, because I'm a pro. <laughs> and if we go in here and compile that, you can see that that works. Oh, wait. No, it doesn't. What did I do wrong? Oh, I did the, I, 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 got, I got ahead of myself. Um, I need to say const three, and then I need to say remainder underscore equals. So that divides, gives me the remainder of that division, un, uh, unsigned. And now I can say if that is zero, then it's minus one, otherwise it's, it's whatever it was. I am just, <laughs> I swear I know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, oh, EQZ. So I need to say, if that is equal to zero, then put true on, the, on it, otherwise it's false. See how much you're learning by watching me fail? <laughs> There we go. So that passes. And we got, uh, let's go ahead and do uh, multiples of five as well, real quick here. Returns minus two for multiples of five. And I'm going to cheat and do two tests at once here. There 
Here we go. And so we got two failing tests. And um, we'll go into here. And now we do that big copy and paste. Now I make the joke about I don't always reuse code. And uh, we put a minus two there. And so that's, that's working. So, um, but you're looking at this code, and you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of duplication. So a refactor is in order. So, um, and I can show you that real quick. We can create another function called um, is multiple. It takes a param named dollar $num, and it's an i32, a param that's dollar $div, and that's an i32, and it returns a result that's an i32. And all this is going to do is basically this, except instead of having a constant there, we'll do a div, we'll divide it, and then we'll do equals. So that function should be good. And then in here, we can instead say, shove these two values on there, and then call dollar is multiple. And so we got rid of two lines of code. <laughs> Let's see if that works real quick. Still good, excellent. And uh, so I want to show real quick here the S expression syntax that I mentioned earlier, because this gets kind of hard to read. So you can start wrapping these things in parentheses and do things like this. That looks more like a programming language, doesn't it? Right? And uh, we can do the same thing down here. We can do the same thing in that function down there at the bottom. And we can do it with the if statement as well. We can say if, then, and we can say return like that. We don't need to end anymore. And honestly, we could even make that just a one line if, because I know that's going to trigger someone. <laughs> and then we could very easily then do the same thing for 3 and minus 1. And then just for uh, completeness, like that. And so let's compile that really quick, real quick. And I've got, I, I've probably got an extra parenthesis somewhere. I'm missing a parenthesis. There we go. Still passes. Excellent. So uh, I'm going to swap this out for a Rust implementation. I've got this Rust implementation here. It does fizzbuzz already. I'm going to break it and say if it's a multiple of 3, return negative 10 instead so that we can see it fail. I'm going to change my spec to load up fizzbuzz.rs.wasm. And I'm going to use this little uh, Rust build script here, which is out on my GitHub. You can check it out. Uh, but all it's doing is just calling, calling the Rust compiler with a particular target and some other arguments that uh, were mostly just things I put in there to make it work. So I, I do say slash Rust build. And uh, we've got now this Rust uh, WASM. And if we reload that, we can see that it complains that minus 10 is not 1. But it still called it. It, it didn't care that it was Rust. We swapped out um, WebAssembly text format for Rust. We fix our Rust code and make that the, z oh, the negative one it should be, and rerun it. You can see all our tests now pass. So that's the demo. <laughs> so um, got about five minutes left here. Here's some resources that I found online. These slides are on my GitHub, so you can, you can download them. So if you don't get a picture, don't feel bad. You can download it as a PDF. Uh, WebAssembly.org is the official site. It's got all the bytecode described. It is targeted towards people who want to build compilers as opposed to people who want to code in it. And so it's not the best resource, but it was useful for this purpose. Mozilla Developer Network's documentation on WebAssembly uh, covers the, uh, the JavaScript side of things. Uh, and so a lot of good information there. Uh, the WebAssembly binary toolkit, Wabbit, is what I was using to compile this. Uh, the WebAssembly toolkit for Visual Studio Code was the Visual Studio Code uh, extension that I was using to also assemble, not compile, assemble this code. 
Uh, Rustin and Scriptum are both good tools to check out for uh, playing with uh, higher level languages if you, you wanted to do some WebAssembly. And then I, there's this wonderful resource, uh, Awesome WASM Languages, talks about all the stuff that's happening in this space. They've got a big list of languages, and they've got either an egg, a chick sitting in an egg, uh, or uh, a, a chick, or a chicken as like icons to show you how fully baked the implementations are. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of eggs on there, let's, I'll be honest. But, um, but there's a lot of cool stuff out there. And this awesome WASM is a curated list of uh, just interesting WebAssembly things. I found one thing, uh, someone wrote a WebAssembly interpreter in Python. I don't know that I would ever need to use that, but it's a fun exercise. <laughs> so uh, check out those resources. Um, this is uh, my intro to WebAssembly. This is where you can find these slides. Uh, the WASM FizzBuzz is the, the, the enterprise FizzBuzz complete with strings and model view controller patterns and everything that I developed with minimal JavaScript glue code. I'm working on a sort of a toy project right now to call it, a, I'm calling it KaiWASM, uh, which is, uh, allows you using web components to create all the st standard glue code you would need to do WebAssembly uh, applications. Um, I'm still playing with that, it's, it's very, very preliminary. Um, I, I don't think I've even made my repo public yet, but uh, I will at some point. So you can check that out if you want to try and put WebAssembly in a browser without having to write all that JavaScript glue code. So that's something I should probably add to this slide. And uh, I'm Guy Royce uh, with Data Robot. Check us out. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, are there any questions? I got three minutes. Right there. Uh, the question is, what is the best, u what, what I think the best use case is? And so obviously this is an opinion question, so this isn't a fact, <laughs> uh, which is fine. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is the best use case, because right now you can really just do compute computation with it, right? You can't do any I.O., any browser manipulation. You have to write bridge functions to do that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think a, as it stands now, an interesting use case would be to take machine learning models and embed them into WebAssembly, not to build not, not to build models from machine learning, but to take the results of a model and put it into a WebAssembly module so you can have that, that model being able to make predictions right there in the browser. So, you know, so it's, a, it's edge computing, right? Um, and so I think that, that's one interesting application. Um, so I don't know if it's the best, but it's, it's an interesting one. I do know, um, I haven't played with this at all, but I know Unity supports WebAssembly. So that's like a compilation target for a Unity game program. So that's kind of cool. Um, but it's generating a lot of JavaScript glue code as well. So, uh, any other questions? I, and I can't see the top rows. So, oh, sorry, I can't. I can't. I have to look down. I feel like I'm a judge. <laughs> So the question is, is uh, uh, the, uh, he found the, the S expressions interesting and he's wondering if there's any uh, uh, use for uh, Lisp in generating WebAssembly or using, uh, using Lisp in that way. Uh, I don't have a good answer for you, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be surprised if someone's tried that. Um, I think the WebAssembly text format's just taking inspiration from there because it's stack based. Putting those parentheses makes it parsable by humans. That's really, so they're stealing an idea from Lisp. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't see any reason why you couldn't have something that compiles list to web, WebAssembly. I think you may have just volunteered yourself for an open source project. <laughs> so, uh, any others? Any uh, debugging, uh, debugging tools, that's a great question. Um, a little bit. Uh, you'll notice that Wabbit gave me uh, error messages that were actually fairly meaningful. Uh, if uh, you run into any kind of problem during uh, running, uh, Chrome will give you meaningful error messages. It'll say things like, hey, there was nothing on the stack when you exited that function, and it will complain. Um, st actually, like stepping through your WebAssembly code, uh, not that I'm aware of. So uh, that's a thing that needs to be built yet. So um, it's all kind of green. It's kind of new. Um, and so this is kind of bleeding edge stuff. So um, uh, I think I use console.log. I think that's my uh, debugger. <laughs> so. Um, well, we're at 1020, so, or 1120, so uh, that's all I got. Uh, thanks a lot. You can ask me questions later, too.